Hello, Hannah. 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 Hello, everyone. No, Welcome to the <laughs> premiere <laughs> of Home. It's connected. We I'm are blessed to have all Thank of you. the uh, main I'm doing people it. involved with the with the film, Actually, especially. <laughs> Uh, and not ex uh, no, I see the video, especially no the director, the editors, the actors and actresses that were all involved to bring this wonderful short film to life. And we just want to have a wonderful discussion with them so that we can discuss how this Thank came you. about, what was no, the feelings during talking. and through the process of actually filming this, and how they were able to pull this off in the middle of COVID. No. <laughs> I mean, these are really big things that we need entertainment, we need messages, we need these type of stories. And to be able to pull this off in the middle of a pandemic is also an amazing thing. So I'm here with the director, uh, Ellie. Echo. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you for well, being here. No, well, I think we need to thank you because this is a wonderful film <laughs> and I've watched it multiple times. Um, as a first generation immigrant myself, no, I Kai really want to get your anything. thoughts on how this story came about. Um, Netflix and Film Independent have started this partnership um, and they wanted to support a few filmmakers of color um, and they, you know, I'm uh, an alumni, an alum of the Film Independent Screenwriting Lab, so they reached out to me and asked me if I had a story to pitch. Um, and Netflix really was interested in stories that spoke to the moment that we're living. Um, this was last year, so 2020, this was summer of 2020. And a lot of things had happened. Uh, George Floyd, um, you know, Ahmaud Arbery, all of these, you know, horrific things had happened in our country. And there was a reckoning, and we were all, and then COVID hit, obviously. And, um, and so they wanted us to write something that spoke to the, the society that we were living in. And I knew that I, I wanted to make a genre film and I, I reached out to Roy immediately and um, and wanted to sort of talk through ideas and we started discussing how we were feeling emotionally, where we were emotionally um, given everything that had happened and it really, the, the seeds of the story came from Roy talking to me about an experience that he had while driving in in a neighborhood that he didn't know. Um, I think he got lost. Mm -hmm. And he said that he found himself in this neighborhood that was completely lined with American flags and then he was terrified. And I completely identified with that feeling and that's kind of how the story began. And um, as an immigrant myself, um, I'm originally from Cameroon. I was born there and I grew up here in the States. I have always felt this, this um, I've always like been a bit of an outsider and so I, I wanted to tell this story from the, within the context of a family and from the, through the immigrant lens, which I don't see that often. And so that's sort of how the story uh, began and it was further developed from there with Roy's help um, and once I started to approach the actors that I knew I wanted to work with, I, um, I did further develop the story with them. Wow. I mean, one, I have to give a lot of props to Film Independent and Netflix for taking on these type of stories. Uh, a lot of people, yes. as you well know, gave a lot of lip service to what was going on in the world and yes. then they might put up a black square, but this is actual content with a message. And uh, that's an amazing standpoint. What, like, what was the process like working with them when you were showing them the treatments and mm -hmm. uh, what you were trying to display? Since this is, there are not, there is a lot of messages that come through and they are not so subtle. 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, they were really supportive from the beginning. And one of the things that I was really impressed with was that they, there was never a sense of them trying to impose anything onto us. They, they, they wanted to support the stories that we wanted to tell. Um, I knew that my story was a, a little bit, um, you know, it, 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 it doesn't shy away from certain things, but um, mm -hmm. they embraced it. They, I think they were excited by it. Um, they were probably wondering how we were going to pull it off, but we did. Um, I couldn't have done it without my incredible team, and I'll, I'll introduce them all later and, and talk about what everyone did. But they, they, were, they were very... Um, they were not intrusive at all. They were much more supportive and, and, and really just helping us to refine the story. So there was, we went through a, a, a certain amount of, um, of feedback. They gave us uh, some feedback on the script. Um, actually, actually, no, they didn't really give us feedback on the script. I think they, they had expressed what they liked about the script. Um, and then they started to get more involved once we had um, footage to show them. That's really where they helped us craft um, the film uh, in post-production. So a lot more in the editing process and the post-production process yes. than the actual filming. That is an amazing concept, especially for a company as large as Netflix, to allow you yes. to have that much freedom. Did that, did that yeah. freedom give you any fear? No. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> um, I prefer it, and I'm very comfortable with that freedom. And um, it was nice because I, I really leaned on my collaborators, Roy, um, my DP Tanks, who I work with uh, on on I worked with previously on, on other projects, and I'm going to be shooting my first feature with him. Um, we're we're such a, a tight knit team. We're used to working together. It was nice not having to have someone standing over our shoulder saying, mm, you know, this doesn't work or please don't do that or, you know. So they really, I think what I respected so much is they wanted to support the stories that we wanted to tell. It wasn't about trying to create a certain narrative or trying to, to craft a narrative in a certain way. They really were there to support our voices. And we took full advantage of that. And I hope this is how it is from here on out. <laughs> Although I know that's, that's not going to be the case but as as a person who's worked in the enter entertainment industry for over 20 years you received a blessing so don't uh, don't get too used to this type of uh, <laughs> type of hands <laughs> off but you you actually led me into the fact that you had such a great team and i would yes. love to dig into that a bit where you're trying to film this again in the middle of covid how was it yes working with people that you already have familiarity with and to make this process a little bit easier? Well, honestly, you know, safety was of the utmost importance for us. It wasn't about, you know, I mean, when COVID hit, it was, an, it was a new thing for everybody. We didn't, I hadn't seen many people for months at that point. So, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be extra careful. I wanted everyone to be safe. So the first thing that Roy and I tackled was how do we do this safely? And I think he, he can speak a little bit more about that because he did such a phenomenal job of building a, a really solid safety plan in order for us to work together. Everyone was tested um, multiple times <laughs> before and during the shooting. And so I think that was... That, that was the first thing we sort of kind of figured out. And then, um, you know, there's a certain level of trust there when you're working with people that you know and you care about as well. And so I, I, for me, it was great because I knew, um, I felt comfortable allowing, we shot in my, in my parents' home, and I felt comfortable allowing them into my parents' home because I, I knew that they, they would be careful and that, they, that, that I could trust that they weren't going out there and behaving recklessly and you know, trying to catch COVID. Um, I, I, there was a certain level of comfort there with, with, with working with, with those people. And I think it was really helpful in that sense. 
Uh, that that is that is amazing, especially in this time where everyone has been responsible and socially distancing. To be able to yeah. feel some type of community is, I'm yeah. sure, was a blessing to your it to really your crew was. and to everyone there. So I think I see Roy is also available here. I did want to talk yes. to the two of y'all about how did you come up with this particular storyline? You don't mm -hmm. see this every day. Uh, as you were saying, being an immigrant, these are not the stories that we see every day on mainstream uh, platforms. Yeah, I think um, for us, we were yeah, trying- Yeah, I mean, Roy, it- Sorry, let me know when you can, when you uh, can hear me. We, Go ahead. I think we have mute on Roy. Oh, sorry, I think I <laughs> muted my microphone, there of course. There we go. Sorry, there guys. Yeah. Um, I think when the opportunity presented itself to pitch, we were trying to figure out a way to sort of give voice to the frustration we were feeling at that particular moment. I think we, we jumped on the phone in June and we're just kind of discussing what might we want to say. We were, we were really feeling down because the pandemic, was, the pandemic was so heavy at that time. I hadn't left the house really other than to go for walks and I hadn't seen anybody. I hadn't had a hug <laughs> in like two and a half months. And, um, you know, of course, in addition to that, we were finding out how COVID was disproportionately affecting communities of color. We were seeing all of the you know, all of the, the incidents that were happening with vigilantes and police in the street against unarmed black people, there were a lot of things that were kind of really frustrating us and bringing us down. And so we wanted to, to find a way to say something about it uh, in a unique way. And we wanted to, to do something in the psychological thriller realm, horror realm. And, um, and Ellie, I always tell her she has a knack towards drifting towards very dark stories. And I was like, Ellie, we, we can do it, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's be easy with it. Um, so we tried to make it very palatable at the same time, but we, we did have uh, some things we needed to, to voice. And you bring up a really good point, Roy, that uh, it does have a dark tone. And so basically it reminds me of some influences could you tell me some influences you might have had when you were coming up with this process for a thriller that has a social message? Yeah, I mean, we, honestly, I mean, go ahead, yeah. Ali. Yes, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. This this one is better for you because you actually took it and wrote it and I'll I'll kind of follow up. <laughs> I mean, when I'm writing, I'm 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 not I didn't have, and I know uh, Get Out is a movie that comes up a lot, and I, I've had, like, even my niece was like, oh, you know, was it inspired by this? It's not that Get Out was the inspiration, because it wasn't necessarily the inspiration. I, in shooting during COVID and in trying to, um, to build, like, a, a safe set, and also it was really about, like, okay, what do I have access to? I had access to my parents' home and to the neighborhood that they live in. And so by default, that became the setting of the movie. It wasn't so much that I set out to make a film that's, that's inspired by Get Out, you know, in that sense. So, so it wasn't. It was really the environment that I'm in that inspired me and some of the stuff that's happened in my own neighborhood that's inspired me um, because we've had... Uh, uh, we had a, a, a new black family move into the neighborhood and their son was traumatized by, um, by a neighbor who, who thought that he was trespassing. So, so I, I would say that, that the story was more fueled by some of those um, things than, than any particular movie. Um, and I just, I drift towards horror and thrillers all the time. So that, that's, that's where my heart lies. And so of course it was going to be, um, that's what it was going to be. And I, I think I told Roy that from the beginning that I wanted to make a social horror. Um, and that was the one thing that, it, that didn't really change from, from when we started talking. All right. And uh, I mean, you saying this part about being influenced by your actual neighborhood, uh, as you, Roy, who grew up in the suburbs himself of Long Island, 
And myself, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City in Middletown, New York. Those stories of young black men being traumatized by their neighborhood because they are they don't quote unquote belong there, even though they live there. It's been 40 years since I've lived in my neighborhood and things still haven't changed. How, how does that affect you as a writer and as an artist when you're thinking about these stories? Well, it's, it's disturbing. You know, it's really disturbing. And for me, I, 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 I don't know, I, I felt an obligation to talk about it and to, to and also because I don't see the immigrant perspective on this that often, I, I don't think I have yet. I'm sure there's probably something that's out there that maybe I'm not aware of, so hopefully nobody crucifies me. Um, but I haven't really seen this story from the immigrant perspective. And I think that a lot of what I was thinking about um, in, the middle, like, in the middle of last year as COVID was hitting and as we were dealing with all the social unrest, I was also thinking about all the contradictions in this country. You know, um, the, the, the fact that this is a country that is supposed to be the land of opportunity for, that is supposed to be welcoming, and yet, you know, certain people have a different, are not welcomed in the same way. Certain people, you know, there's, there's always, there's like two, there's a double standard for, for people of color in this country. And particularly when you're an immigrant, it's, it's a whole other level of, of you don't belong, you know, if you have a, an accent or if you have a different religious, if you have different religious beliefs. Um, and so I really wanted to give voice to that because I felt that really deeply. Um, and I mean, Roy can chime in and, and add a bit more if he wants, but that's really where it was well, coming from for me. Well, that that's deep. And I also wanted to bring up the fact that it's not just us talking, but please, as people who are watching through the live stream on YouTube, please send us your questions so that we could send this over to this wonderful uh, group. And you had such great actors that were involved, and you said earlier that you included them in the process as well. So I want to bring them into the into the fold and talk to them about you know how they brought their own personal experiences into how the film, you know, actually came about. I'm sure that there were some pieces of the script that got a little bit more formalized when you actually casted uh, certain people and how they could bring their own experiences to it. Um, I'd love to start off with Suleiman as the father. I had a father just like you, Suleiman. So uh, <laughs> watching watching the film brought back. A, uh, I had to call my therapist afterwards. But how how did you? Uh... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about how your involvement in the film and and how you portrayed the father and his very um, very as my daughter said immigrant experience as soon as she saw you on screen. Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm very, very grateful and um, I'm so proud, you know, to be part of this project. It was amazing. Obviously, I watched it over and over. Um, it's beautiful. I'm very, very happy about that. Uh, so I've known Ellie for a number of years now. You know, we've grown to be uh, to become what I would call really good friends. And so when she told me about it, you know, uh, I was obviously going to do it. You know, it sounded really, really good. And like she said, we were in a time where we were all, like, I was full of rage, you know, what was going on. And also I was feeling very, very disempowered, you know, this feeling of like, okay, this thing keeps coming and what do I do? And then I got two, you know, I got two little kids. And when I looked at them, really what got me was two things. It's like... It's been many generations going. So the first thing was that, wow, it's going to keep going. So they're going to go through that too. And another thing was that, wow, when they look at me, you know how when your kids look at you or you look at your parents, if you remember, they're Superman. They can do everything. You know, this is like a, this is like a cornerstone, I think, of a relationship between kids and parents. And now... Your kids are looking at you like, what's going on? Like, you know, like this is going on and what are you doing? 
You can't even look at your kid in the eyes because you can't bring anything. You can't, you, you know what's waiting on them, waiting for them, and you feel doubly guilty that you can't do anything about it. So that was kind of like the basis of how I pushed the work. And I think one of the most heartbreaking and most important thing for me in that scene was at the end, when I tell him to just wave and smile, I felt like I was, oh man, I felt like I was asking him to sell his soul because I was asking him to accept the unacceptable, you know, because mm -hmm. I couldn't find an answer. I was asking him to accept that situation. And it was very, and I know usually, you know, in films we want to end up strong and positive, but I couldn't really find anything positive in that. I just wanted, as parents, I want my kid to survive. Hopefully he would grow and find an answer where I couldn't. But in that moment, I was very aware that I was asking him to sell his soul. So, yeah. Uh, and that is that talk. Like, people always talk about the, the talk you have to have with your kids. And I, and I think black men have to have two talks with their kids. One is about the birds and the bees. And the other one is about survival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, Dream survival. And a lot of that survival. Yeah, and a lot of that survival is, like you said, about selling a part of your soul so that you don't get caught up. I wanted to bring up the fact that, you know, you also had a partner in this film. This is another great thing about this movie is that it is a two-parent household. And we have, you know, Vicky who was there and she, uh, and she was trying to, in my, in my estimation, help. <laughs> uh, make sure that help save the butt of the sun as often as possible. But, <laughs> but Vicky, tell us about your thoughts about your character and, and what and what inspired you about, you know, how you were going to bring this to life. Well, it's the, you know, the plight of the son and the dignity also of the father, because, uh, it, you know, Yvette, the character in the film, is walking um, a tightrope. She understands both sides, right? And she understands, I should say, I understand that my husband is really quite married to this idea of the American dream and moving up, you know, in this, uh, this ladder, the military, and how I can see how you know, the cards are stacked against him and he can't see that he still believes. And at the same time, he's very much afraid for his son because as we, when we know what happens to little black boys in America. And I can see how he's, um, his fear is really driving a wedge between the two of them. So, the, is really the plight of Yvette, you know? How do I help, as you said, my son, and at the same time, uh, just kind of hold up my man, you know? And uh, I, struggle with that, I struggle with that throughout the film, but then it becomes at a certain point, and I can't remember when, but it, it's really, oh, well, yeah, it's, my, I can see how much my son is suffering. And really, it's all about the kid. For me, it's all about the kid. I mean, if it's not, if life isn't all about the children, then I don't know what it's for. And it's very clear that um, he is going to need his father. And so that's when I, you know, finally go, okay, you know, that's enough, enough, enough. And I, actually, I don't know where it goes, like after this film, you know, let's say if they, you know, give away any spoilers, but it's kind of like if it <laughs> hadn't turned out the way it turned out, then ooh, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm <laughs> like a body mess. You know what I'm saying? And it's like you know, is this all about all about the kids? So um, I don't know. That's pretty much it. Uh, the only other thing that you know uh, I'd like to express is, and I, I get really gushy around this group. And I don't care if it's not cool. Um, this is the most amazing group of people I, I think I've ever worked with. 
Um, like they were saying before, it's a tight group and I was coming in new, but I never for one moment felt like I was some kind of an outsider or that I had to prove anything. I've never ever seen a crew like this where, you know, these guys did their jobs really well and then they could do each other's jobs really well as well. And I was like, that blew me away. And then the way that Tinks and Roy and Ellie work together, it's so deeply inspiring. Like you guys have yet to see how much you inspired me, but you will. Well, that, that, is, that is amazing. That's a beautiful sentiment. Uh, um, I, I, I also wanted to talk about, you had two very powerful moments in the film from where I looked at it. The first one was when you were talking to your husband about the fact that you need to, you need to slow it down. You need to, you need to, you know, back up a little bit or else you're going to lose them. And, um, and I know my mom has had that conversation with my father many, many times. <laughs> um, but then the second part, which was almost a turnaround, was after you had that conversation, you then, as you said, gave your man the reins and said, handle this. How, did, how do you go from one section to the other in between those two seeds and, and feel empowered that, you, that he got the message? Ooh, that has a lot to do. There's two things. Um, that's the writing, frankly. Uh, it was just so well written. When something's like that, you just, you just do what's on the page, man. And it was all there for me the cause and effect, the story, everything was there. All I had to do was just do my work as an actor and there it was, frankly. And the other part of it is the actors, right? Um, Solomon and, and Malachi, they were like giving it 100% and all I had to do was listen, that's it. And the rest just kind of took care of itself. The generosity all the way around in this production, you know, all I had to do was show up and do my job now. All right. Let, let's let's go back then to Ellie real quick. Um, yeah, I, I was because initially when um, when I was selected to 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 for you know to to make this movie, um, the initial period that we had to make it was very very short. So initially, I thought I I'm I'm writing for. The, the actors that I know already, which is why Suleiman was at the, Suleiman was, was the first actor that I, I called because I, I, um, I was sort of already had him in mind when I was writing the, the, the script. And, um, and, and I knew that it was gonna be challenging finding a, a teenage boy, the right teenage boy. I don't know that many. And, um, mm -hmm. and I don't tend to write for children either. So um, I sort of kind of went out to my network. Vicky was one of the people I reached out to. And Malachi's manager happened to get in touch with me. She saw a post about the, 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 the film. And I was just really so, it was a blessing. Um, because I'd, I'd seen a, a whole bunch of people who just weren't quite right. And as soon as Malachi sent in his tape, I knew I knew he was the right person, and um, and then I started with him and his mom, and and she's just equally generous and amazing, and it just felt right from the beginning, and I, it, yeah, it was a very easy decision to cast him for those reasons. And uh, I was told that you have a brother. Was your brother any uh, a part of the the character build? When you were when you were coming up with Malachi's character, a little bit, yes. I mean, the relationship between my brother and my dad. My dad was definitely a lot harder on my brother than he was on me. Um, just like my mom was a lot harder on me than she was on my brother. I think there's something there. Um, so I, yeah, I, there's a lot of that that I wrote into the script. Um, although. Malachi is quite different. My brother wasn't like into classical music. Those me that really put into the character. I was, I was a classical music nerd um, as a as you know, really as a teenager, and 
Um, and I thought it might be cool to, to, to put that into the character. And yeah, so it was a myself and my other actually to, that, that formed Jonah. Yeah, and, and I love the fact that there- I hear him. Let's go back to Malachi now. Mal Malachi, Let's you probably Malachi. heard all the questions, although it was delayed. I have no uh, idea. Oh, can, can, can I just say something about the music? Absolutely, Ellie, yes. Um, because part of the reason, I, I knew Fatrine was the perfect person to score this. Um, Fatrine is, Fatrine um, has an incredible sensibility. He is uh, a concert pianist, but in, that's his background. Mm. I mean, he... Wow. So I, I already knew in my mind that... You know, I wanted somebody who had that sensibility in order to access the, the that classical music layer um, that we um, that we introduce the character with, and so I, I and it, I'm I'm still amazed. I, I said so little to him in, in in terms of you know what I wanted. I just. I think I think we have such similar sensibilities. It was just there, and he came up. I think the melancholic was the only word I might have used in describing what I wanted the, the music to feel like, and he just came up with this incredible theme, um, and it worked from the, the the opening. And that's an amazing thing that you were talking about with your team. Oh, is that for Trine? Oh yeah, Fatrine is there. Yeah, please, Fatrine, speak. Yep, go ahead. There we go. Great. Fatrine, the floor is yours. Tell us about your process. <laughs> um, let's see. Seems like everything is going wrong today. All right, so, <laughs> yes, back. Uh, well, Ellie um, sent me the script. She said that she had a very good, um, she had a new, uh, a new script she was working on. And it involved a um, classical pianist, a boy classical pianist. And um, I think as a composer, I, I primarily start forming sort of a musical language in my mind originally in some way. Um, and then, to be honest with you, I, I think we I wanted to see because there's always a difference between script and what's shot. Um, she sends me the rough cut. I really like the film. Um, and after that, I think it's you. You really we wanted something classical, um, where I had to dig deep into that sort of classical sound, but not yet f coming out of a classical piece. So we wanted to sort of interweave the classical music, but yet be filmic, and still have uh, this sort of um, introvertive. I would say is the key word because the boy, the shot yeah. opens with him in his headphones. And we wanted something where, you know, when you move into a new neighborhood, you're looking for peace. You know, you're looking for an advancement of your soul in some way. You're looking, you know, to something else. And, and I think, you know, we, I wanted to set the tone between peace, love, um, unity of, of all the ideas. And that's where the classical element comes in. I think that it unifies, you know, every single person in the world equally it's just music it's it's not necessarily genre per se so i felt that we needed that you know that internal element and then a development of the score needed to have um an in introverted horror psychological horror rather i would say less physical and um i and i think um yeah and as the cuts changed, I think I needed to make my own adjustments, but primarily, um, yeah, it's fusing two genres, the, the psychological horror and, and the classical was primarily where I was going for. Well, that is, that is amazing. And, and please note for our viewers, please send over your questions in the YouTube chat. But I, I wanted to, I was very impressed by the fact that you and Ellie could come together on what the score would be and to choose classical music. Uh, you know, I am a horror genre fan myself, 
and uh, whenever you get some of those tones, you know someone is something bad is about to happen, or someone's <laughs> going to die. Um, <laughs> but also, uh, I'm impressed by the fact that, uh, and this is going to sound very stereotypical, that there was no real hip hop or R and B or anything like that inside a <laughs> black you. genre film, right? And Thank so. You. That, that was also very impressive that you brought that to light as well because the, comp the musicianship was very, very prominent in the, in the film. And so that was, that to hear your process is amazing. Thank you for saying that because it was oh, a note man. I was given that I ignored. Um, <laughs> there was like in one ear and out the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, and that's that part where you're dealing with an executive who thinks that it has mm -hmm. to be in a certain way, and you're like, no, that is not my vision. And yes. from an immigrant standpoint, there, there's no hip hop going on in the house. <laughs> but also, but also, even more importantly, why does it have to be hip hop because it's a black teenager? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. So I, 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 I push back on that because I, I, I wanted to go against the grain and I wanted to lean into my original vision and also because I was the kid that was coming home from school and listening to Beethoven and listening to Brahms and so I, yeah, why not? And I think that is a great transition now that we have Malachi back into talking about his character and all of these different elements that were thrown at you that you had to incorporate yeah. into your portrayal. Okay, can you hear me now? Well, you yes. are perfect. <laughs> okay, um, first, Ellie, I'm so sorry for cutting you off. That was the, the delayed version of me. It wasn't intentional, so I wanna get that out there. Okay, <laughs> okay. we're back. Um, yeah, um, it was, I mean, I don't want to say it was challenging. I mean, it was challenging, but it was, I was up for the challenge, you know. I think when we, when I read the scene, the script or whatever, that, you know, it immediately, like, everything was just like, whoa, I need to do this. And luckily, I did it. So, but, um, yeah, I remember there were days on set where, like, Ellie would be like, imagine you see this. Because, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of, everything is in here so finding the the authenticity of really uh imagining these you know terrible things that are happening that you see in the film um i uh, a lot of it was just creating who Jonah is and uh figuring out the things that make him him and you know less about like so it's like not Malachi it's Jonah i think it was a lot it was a lot of like Ellie giving me little tips about, oh, he plays piano. Uh, music is, you know, you see when the film opens. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of character building and uh, it was very, very fun. And um, yeah, I love the film. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. No, no, that's a great thing. And you also, uh, you guys are making this easy for me to, to, to do the uh, flow because you also bring up the fact that at the start of the film you're, you're playing you know there's the music in the in the start but that's not how you started filming it it was all different out of order you had one day to film everything outdoors and so i wanted <laughs> to bring up the fact that <laughs> that how did you have the basically the penultimate scene at the end talking to your father and getting that man-to-man -man talk as the first thing that you filmed. Like, you, you're, you're thrown into the fire without actually having that connection with him yet. Um, uh, I, I think that's probably more for thought. me to answer. <laughs> okay, Ellie, go it ahead. A, it was a product. No, 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 I will jump in because the, it, it, it was a, a really a product of the schedule. Um, and it wasn't mm -hmm. so much a decision. Um, and, and, and I want to start to rope in Tinks on this too, because the yes. first thing that we 
discussed when he came to my house to do the tech scout was the weather's got to be, you know, it's got to be cloudy, it's got to be this. And we had, we did have like a day, a day and a half outside. And so the decision to shoot that first scene, the, the last scene first, was really a product of, I mean, we had the ideal weather um, that first day. And we started in the park. Um, for those reasons, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and I, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now. But that, I, I just wanted to. No, say that's that. a, <laughs> no, that makes perfect <laughs> sense. And I haven't been able to have a chance to bring Tinks in yet. So, Tinks, tell us yeah. about you know your thought process and and working with DPs. They're like, I need the right light. <laughs> I need the right <laughs> atmosphere. To talk to us about that. <laughs> Sure. So I guess uh, it, it was really my fault that we had to shoot the last scene first. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, given... I like that you took credit but it worked for that. Out. That's a good man. <laughs> it worked out. Right? So yeah, given the amount of time we had to shoot, and because we were so dependent on weather, um, we saw in the forecast that it would be cloudy for for just the the two days. So we're like, oh no, we got to get those exteriors at that time. Yeah. Um, but also we, we talked about in prep, uh, the idea or the look of the film. It's just the idea that uh, there's this kind of oppressive, ominous white light. And then there's one specific scene where it's really a literal blast of white light. But that was something that we, we thought about and thought that could be a visual metaphor, I guess, um, because, uh, yeah. I mean, the space and the location, the, the neighborhood is very much a character in the story as well. So we, we just wanted uh, that feeling and, and to establish that. Um, uh, does that answer the question? <laughs> No, that, I'm better, does. I'm better behind also... the camera, not in front of the camera. I'm really nervous in, in front of the line section. <laughs> well, you're, you're doing a great job, and I'm not going to let you off the hook just yet, Tix. So okay. uh, when it comes when it come down to making a lot of these shots, like the flags and in the woods, like what was your what was your thought process on on, on getting those shots and making those images speak for themselves? Or, um, well, the flag actually, we, we got it in like, I don't know, it was very last minute in a couple of seconds. Actually, I, I don't know if I can be honest in saying that I actually wanted to reshoot that flag okay. shot. Uh, and then uh, we were in crunch time and we couldn't get it done. Um, but actually, the, the Confederate flag was something uh, I, I think they found in post because uh, it, it was actually a, uh, something that they, they decided. I guess overall, you can speak more to it that it, it, it would have been more effective to use the, that Confederate flag first. But the American flag, actually, it just so happened, you know, we're running and gunning through the neighborhood shooting this, uh, this scene where he gets lost, which was actually cut from the film. Um, but yeah. it just happened there was this tattered American flag and it was like, oh, shoot, we got to get that now uh, while we can. <laughs> and that, that's the story behind the flag, really. Um, but we, we did plan on getting a shot of the flag it just because of time or we just, it just never came, came about. Um, but in terms of the, the wind woods, not cooperating. Yeah. Oh yeah. The wind not cooperating. That's that too. Cause we did, we, yeah, we did look at the flag and it was just limp. So I was, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, nothing good comes from yeah. limp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 And the woods, um, we actually we thought we were going to shoot it on a sunny day so during noon you know the sun just cuts through but it just so happened mm -hmm. it was cloudy and we can keep it consistent that way and that and yeah. that was an ominous enough uh, for us to get the the feeling um so uh it was i think the first or second day that we got that shot yeah and i thank you for sharing that because you know you always have a plan Elliot Tinks, especially with you're like, oh, we want bright light coming through, and then you're like, oh, it's cloudy, and it almost fits better <laughs> than your original thought process. Um, I have to ask about the indoor scenes as well, the 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 new scenes and and with the red and the and the light coming in during the nightmare scene, you know, so all of those things. 
Tinks, you, you got to tell us, how, how did you make that come about? And Ellie, what was your thoughts on how to get that done? Like, where did that come from? I'm, I'm going to jump in and say that this is why I love working with Tink so much. And it was really pure collaboration between the two of us because it was written the way it is and the way you see it. But Tink's... Um, brought so much to it. For instance, like that scene was originally written in the kitchen. And when Tinks mm -hmm. came to my house, he was like, no, this would be better in the, your garage. And so he really took the lead on like kind of, you know, just taking the idea that I had in the script and really like opening it up. And then the, and by moving it to the garage, it just like opened up even more because you have those lo little windows up there. And, um, and I'll let him talk more about that because it's it's one of my it's probably one of my favorite scenes in the movie and I and I think it's just he did such a phenomenal job with with lighting it, um, so yeah you can take this one thanks. <laughs> thanks. Um, well, I guess working in locations we're kind of at the mercy of the space, so yeah. uh, I guess my process is I'm always thinking well first the story and what works. Um, for the story, because you have to stay as true as possible to, I guess, the, what's written. But at the same time, I feel like uh, that's why scouting is so important. Uh, when Ellie and I, uh, we looked at her house, uh, we just discovered, you know what, maybe, maybe it works better in the garage. Um, not only logistically or technically, where we can bring this light that flashes through. And since it's a dream sequence, you can really, you know, go all out. Um, because the most of the film is shot naturally. Um, and then Ellie had the brilliant idea of going red. And you know what? Because the most of the film, we, we decide to go in a neutral color because, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. typical for horror films that, you know, it's dark, contrasty, or, you know, with the blue light or whatever. But again, we wanted that it's the idea that, you know, normal, whatever's normal is, is scary for an immigrant. Or, or for a black American, um, uh, the status quo is, 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 is it's not, it, 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 it's, it's actually oppressive, it's scary. So the, the whole idea of keeping all the colors neutral and natural, as if, you know, we're in the real world, uh, it felt like it, it, would, it would give us, a, you know, another metaphor. And that's always something we're trying to do uh, visually. But then when we get to the dream, Ellie wrote, uh, she wants a red light. And at first, like, wait a minute, a red light? Uh, well, first of all, how are we going to get a red light? <laughs> so then there's the, there's the technical part. But you know what? And then when we saw the garage, it's like, oh, shoot, we can, we can get the red light in here. First, that, that's one. And two, it, it actually, we can add something else. That whole idea of the white light, a press of white light, we could bring that beam through. Mm -hmm. And so we did that through the, through the, the, the glass of the door. And then uh, I had a great gaffer. Uh, we collaborate uh, often in different project, Maria Cabra. And she just killed it with the, the lights that we, from outside. And she just swung the, uh, the light as, as we shot, we did the takes. And, and you bring up such a great point about the balance between horror and reality. And someone actually asked in the chat saying, how do you, how did you decide the balance between what is horror, what is reality? But in this film, reality for the for black people is the horror. So, Ellie, could you talk yes. about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that for me, it was really like focusing on the everyday things that are that for most people, you know, you don't necessarily even pay attention to. And I will say the initial uh, iteration of this uh, story was supposed to take place over the summer. Um, and because mm -hmm. we had to kept pushing back, things changed. But in the first version of the script, for instance, we had Jonah being attacked by a sprinkler. Um, so it was like, so, so it's, it's exactly what Tink said, where it, it's like, it's the ordinary things, the things that um, are harmless that actually create the horror in this movie. And, and just leaning into um, the reality as the horror, um, that was, it was, it was, it was, it was easier to, to pull out, um, the, the genre from there, because I think that, that 
is how a lot of people experience it, unfortunately. Very valid I, uh, points. And, I, and I want to bring up a lot of those images that you brought up for your actors. I mean, Suleiman and, and, and Malachi, you had to have nooses around your neck. Um, they'd have to pay me extra for that. Okay. Uh, how did you feel going, going over? I'm going to try to jump in soon. Through that process of, you know, during the dream sequence so that, you know, you're, you're there struggling. Uh, this is for Malachi or for Suleiman? Both of you. Suleiman, why don't you go first? Oh, man. I mean, this is such a, obviously, it's a very heavy have you seen? You know, I mean, anytime we see a rope, we don't want to have nothing to do with it. You know, mm -hmm. it brings so much, uh, you know, it brings so much, so much back. So that though made it easy to play. You know, I didn't have to do anything. Like, you know, the visual of the rope around my neck and that's it. You know, the whole communication is, uh, you know, is, is assured, but, it was easy to play, but it was definitely uh, like hard to to deal with it. Like there's too too much darkness in in that little rope. So, you know, and if you make just make it work for the scene, you do it then and you just let it let it be. You know, so yeah, yeah. Like like I said, it w it was heartbreaking to watch that scene. And 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 Malachi, what what was going through your mind as a you know as a 17 year old? You you know going through that. Um, I couldn't wait to take it off. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, it was. That, that's not a joke, was, uh, man. That's real. No, I mean you're right, actually. Um, I mean I don't know. I mean I guess when you're trying to get yourself in that place, it's it's almost like for me at least. I remember like wanting it to feel a little uncomfortable, just like for me to really feel that that uncomfortability of like, you know, my body getting hot just because you can feel it slightly like too hard on your Adam's apple. I don't know, it sounds like uh, crazy, but it helped me get to that place even more, you know? And then Solomon right in front of me, I don't know. It it was almost like you, you would never imagine yourself in that in that place in your life, but it was, uh, it was creating that as a reality for the film that made it more like, I guess easier to connect to, but I'm, um, yeah, it was very dark, but uh, it was, it wasn't like that on set though, but to get in that place, I think it's, it's, it looks crazier than it actually felt, but when you're like, when the cameras are rolling, you gotta crank it up like that. So it was one of my favorite moments too. So, yeah. Well, that, that's amazing. And, and, and I wanted to ask one more question of you, Malachi. What did it feel like trying to provide all these clues to your parents that this place is messed up and they couldn't see any of it, but you were seeing all of it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna bring this up to uh, Suleiman and Vicky of why do you think that is that you just were numb to this? Um, you want me first or? Oh, yeah, well, I was going to say yeah. Malachi first, like what, what was his thought process having to deal with parents who couldn't see what he could obviously see? And they, you know, they thought of him as crazy until the end. <laughs> um, it actually, it really helped uh, Ellie. I remember her like just giving us the freedom to not rely on the words too much because that was one of the first things I thought of like before we did it a lot of the times and uh, a lot of like the really, really like really good stuff, the stuff that I felt came from just speaking from Jonah's perspective and just uh, so I think in those moments genuinely and it helps because Vicky and Solomon, they like, they play it off really well where it's like, you, are you okay? Like what's going on? This, you know, this teenager, maybe it's his hormones or something like <laughs> it just added the fuel <laughs> to the fire for me to get to that place so yeah